This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 39, The Markandeya Sessions, Part 3. Last time, Markandeya continued with his storytelling and philosophizing. He gave us his version of the Four Ages, which totaled 12,000 years, and ends with the Kali Yuga, which lasts only 1,200 years. It seems like we get different calculations of the length of each Yuga, depending on the source. If Markandeya is correct, and if we accept the common dating for the start of the Kali Yuga at Krishna's death, then we can rest easy in the knowledge that the last Kali Yuga ended centuries ago, and we are all enjoying the next cycle's golden age. Markandeya's next story involves another king of Yodhya. Like the last one we met, Parikshit, this one is also a descendant of Ikshvaku, named Kuvalashva. Yudhishthira specifically asked to hear the story of how King Kuvalashva came to be known as Dundamara, or the slayer of Dundu. This story begins with a Brahmin named Utanka, who performed austerities at a retreat near the desert. This hermit happened to have had a bad neighbor, a Dhanava named Dundu. Dundu lived in the desert under the ground and occasionally came up to make trouble by blowing up big sandstorms. One day, the god Vishnu came to Utanka in person and explained that this Dundu had acquired the special boon that no god or supernatural creature could ever destroy him. This should have been enough to assure Dundu's protection, because no mortal human could possibly overpower this mighty creature. Vishnu had a plan, however. He told Utanka to seek out the prince of Ayodhya and instruct this Kshatriya to take down Dundu. Utanka did as he was told and left his hermitage for the kingdom of Ayodhya. There he found Kuvalashva, newly crowned king by his father, who had retired to the forest. Utanka met with Kuvalashva and explained to him the trouble with Dundu and Vishnu's offer of assistance. He told the king that Vishnu would endow him with the god's powers if he would take on the task. Kuvalashva agreed, but then asked for more details about his opponent. Utanka explained that Dundu's parents were powerful demons who had been around since the beginning of time, named Madhu and Kaitaba. They were there when Brahma sprang from the lotus and Vishnu's navel. These two proud demons teased and frightened this young instance of Brahma and irritated him to such a degree that he shook the lotus and this woke up Vishnu. Apparently, the first person Vishnu sees when he wakes up gets granted a boon because Vishnu offered the two demons a boon. These two proud demons laughed and said, No, no, we are your benefactors, so you should ask us for a boon. Now, it's not good to play tricks on Vishnu, because he's pretty tricky himself. The god agreed and asked them to allow him to kill them. The demons were as good as their word, and they allowed Vishnu to kill them. This pair, however, already had a son, none other than Dundu. Dundu had a chip on his shoulder now, and, determined to make trouble, he performed intense austerities, and finally won from the gods the power of invulnerability from all gods and supernatural creatures. Having the form of something like a fire-breathing dragon, Dundu gave the finger to the gods and buried himself beneath the desert sands, blowing fire and tormenting hermits at Utanka's ashram. Now, having heard what he was up against, Kuvalashva summoned his army, as well as his 21,000 sons, and marched them off to encounter this dragon from the beginning of time. As the army set out, with the hermit Utanka at the lead, the spirit and power of Vishnu entered into Kuvalashva's body, while flowers rained from the sky and a loud voice rang from the heavens, saying, This majestic prince shall be called Dundamara, the slayer of Dundu. Meanwhile, Indra obligingly provided a pleasant rain shower to keep the dust down, while the other gods parked their vamanas over Dundu's lair to watch the fight. When the army reached Dundu's lair, they spread out, surrounding the patch of earth beneath which Dundu remained in hiding. Since the beast would not come out and fight, the king then ordered his sons to dig it up. The 21,000 boys commenced the digging, and after seven days' work, they finally uncovered the dragon. The monster was still sleeping as they uncovered it, and the king did not wait for it to wake up. He ordered the first assault immediately. The boys rushed in, as did the king and the rest of the army, attacking from all sides. The rain of spears, arrows, and warhammers finally woke the beast, and it angrily counterattacked, spewing fire in all directions. In an instant, the king's entire brood of sons were consumed by the fire. The king then resorted to his superpowers, generating a flood of divine water which extinguished the dragon's fire. He then unsheathed his Brahma weapon and sent it flying at Dundu's head. 
the creature was instantly beheaded and fell back into his pit, dead and defeated. While the gods celebrated up in the sky, and the powers of Vishnu returned to their master, King Kuvalashva searched the wreckage for any survivors. Out of the 21,000 sons, only three had survived. But this was quite enough to carry on the dynasty through the next generation, so the king was happy. Markandeya ended this story, saying, Thus I have told you the story of Dundamara, and anyone who hears this will become devoted to Dharma and will have many sons. Yudhishthira then requested another story. This time, he wanted to hear more about the Dharma of those people doomed to menial and demeaning tasks. In a surprisingly sensitive passage, Yudhishthira asked about the Dharma of women. He said, Sir, I wish to hear you tell of the greatness of women and the subtleties of women's Dharma. It seems to me that a woman's duty to obey her husband must be the most difficult to perform. I do not see anything harder than trying to be constantly pleasing and obedient to one's husband, mother, and father. What is more marvelous than a woman who is devoted to her husband, speaks the truth, and carries a child for ten months in her womb? After exposing themselves to great danger and suffering, women give birth to sons with great hardship and raise them with great love. I also wonder about men who are engaged in cruel or demeaning occupations and are despised for it, and yet they continue to perform these tasks. Markandeya said, Some consider the mother most important, while others believe it is the father. But the mother who rears her children does a difficult thing. Fathers obtain sons by worshipping the gods, making offerings, and performing austerities. But for women, no offering, sacrifice, or austerity can help her. She attains heaven by obedience to her husband. The sage then elaborated on his point with a couple of linked stories about the devoted wife and the butcher. Not surprisingly, both stories revolve around the character of a Brahmin named Kaushika. Kaushika was a prickly fellow with a bad attitude. His adventures began one day when he was out meditating and saluting the sky. A big bird, a female heron, flew over and dumped a huge turd right on Kaushika's head. The Brahmin looked up angrily and glared at the bird, causing her heart to stop beating. The bird plunged from the sky and fell dead to the ground. Looking at the dead creature on the ground, Kaushika felt remorseful and wished he had controlled his anger better. Vowing to be more forbearing, the hermit fetched his begging bowl and left for the nearby village to beg his food. The first house he approached was occupied by a peasant family. The young peasant wife opened the door and Kaushika demanded his alms. The woman went back into the house to fetch grain. As she was working on this, her husband entered the house, tired and hungry from working in the fields. Seeing that her husband had arrived, the woman rushed to him, washed his feet, prepared his dinner, and served him the food. She did not eat with him, and instead waited on him, planning to eat the leftovers later. Meanwhile, Kaushika was waiting for his food and was beginning to get annoyed. The thought did occur him to lay a particularly nasty curse on this young family, but then he remembered he was working on his anger management. Finally, the wife remembered the waiting mendicant, and embarrassed, she rushed back to serve him. Kashika scolded her, saying, What is the meaning of this? I could have gone to another house rather than wait so long. Hoping to calm the angry Brahmin, she said, Please forgive me. My husband is my greatest god, and he came home tired and hungry, so I took care of him. The Brahmin said, you mean Brahmins are not as important as a serf? Indra himself bows to Brahmins. You insolent woman, don't you know that an angry Brahmin can burn up the earth? The woman replied, I do not mean to belittle Brahmins. I know of the power of the Brahmins. I know that because of their anger they made the ocean salty and undrinkable. I have heard how the great Asura Vatapi was digested by Agastya. Now please excuse my transgression. My dharma is to serve and obey my husband, and that is fine with me. Among all deities, my husband is my paramount god, and, as a result of my devotion, I have been given certain knowledge. For instance, I saw how you killed that bird in the forest, and I know that you did it out of anger. I also know that a true Brahmin controls his temper. Clearly, you can use some instruction in the subtleties of Dharma. I suggest you go to the town of Matilla and talk to the butcher there. This guy is obedient to his mother and father, is self-possessed, and speaks honestly. He can explain Dharma to you. Rather than becoming irate, Kaushika took all this to heart and he thanked the peasant woman for advice and then set out for Matilla. 
As he wandered into Matilda's surroundings, Kashika immediately noticed the orderly calm it exuded from the whole kingdom. He saw happy, hard-working peasants and virtuous Brahmins. As he entered the city, he marveled at the walls and battlements and the efficiency of the king's guards. All the citizens credited their good king Janaka for the good order and the virtue of the people. Kashika then made his way to the city's meat market and found the butcher there, selling meat to an orderly crowd of citizens. Kashika waited for the butcher to finish his transaction, but the butcher noticed the Brahmin standing there and hurried over to him. He said, You should not be standing here. Let me take you to my home and we'll see what I can do for you. Since a Brahmin really shouldn't be hanging around in a meat market, the two hurried over to the butcher's modest but clean home. Kashika was presented the seat of honor, and as the butcher washed his feet, Kashika noticed how well kept the house looked and that the butcher's elderly parents were taken care of faithfully. Kashika said to his host, It seems to me that your occupation is not fitting for someone as virtuous as you. The butcher replied, Please do not be angry with me, sir. I do the job that was done by my father and his father before that. I do my best in this situation. I obey my elders. I give charity when I can. I despise nothing and hold no one in contempt. Society only functions when everyone sticks to their born profession, and this is the profession I was born to. Our king Janaka is true to his dharma, and he in turn ensures that everyone else is true to their own. He imposes justice fairly on all classes of people, and would imprison his own son if the boy behaved lawlessly. As for me, I sell meat of pigs and buffaloes, because that is my dharma. I do not, however, kill the animals, nor do I eat meat. I observe the fasts and I honor the gods. No matter how humble our beginnings, all people can improve themselves. I must have committed sins in my past life to deserve this current occupation. I have learned that if one remembers their past misdeeds, you need only repent of those actions and you are freed of the sin. Since my misdeeds were in a past life, I do not recall what it was I did wrong. The way one is cleansed of the sins of prior lives is to live by your dharma in this life. Kashik was delighted by this butcher's philosophizing, and he had many questions about good conduct and the nature of karma and the senses. I'll spare you all the details, because it is standard Hindu fare, which I'm sure you've heard before. When their dialogue completed, Kashik praised his host, saying, It was my great fortune that I met you today. I shall take your words to heart, and I will go home to care for my parents. But first, please tell me, how did you end up a butcher? Dharma is normally a mystery to a commoner, but you are a true master. The butcher then confessed that he may have been born a commoner this lifetime, but that in his previous life he was a Brahmin, born to an important family. He was friends with the king, and they would practice archery together. One day, the pair went out hunting, and the Brahmin's arrow accidentally struck a sadhu. As the pair rushed to the sadhu's side, the hermit cried out, You've killed an innocent man. For your crime, you shall be born a serf and the son of a butcher. Our protagonist begged for mercy. He said, I didn't mean to do this. Please forgive me, my lord. The sadhu replied, The curse cannot be changed, but my natural kindness compels me to do you this one favor. Although you will be born a serf, you will be wise in the ways of dharma, and you will be devoted and obedient to your mother and father. You will retain your memories of your past lives and will earn great merit. When the curse has expired, you shall again be born a Brahmin. Fortunately, the arrow was removed from the hermit and the old guy survived. The butcher was still condemned to life as a commoner, but at least he was freed from the crime of killing a holy man. That's all for now. This also pretty much wraps up the Markandeya stories. Next time, we'll get back to our heroes, but we'll stay on the subject of women's dharma, as Draupadi and Krishna's wife Satyabhama have a talk on how they please the men in their lives. Thanks for listening.